Hello, this is Blair Hodges, your host of the Maxwell Institute podcast. And before we dive into the latest interview, I have an exciting announcement. The Neil A. Maxwell Institute is teaming up with the Faith Matters Foundation to bring you a new series of video interviews as part of the Maxwell Institute podcast. This new video series is called Maxwell Institute Conversations. LDS scholar Terrell Givens will host these fascinating conversations, and they'll appear in your podcast feed right alongside your regularly scheduled episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast. You can watch for the first episode of Maxwell Institute Conversations coming in May. Also, I wanted to thank Bree Eva for leaving a five-star review of our show in iTunes. Here's what she had to say. I've had some of my most provocative and meaningful gospel conversations with friends and family begin with, did you catch the latest Maxwell Institute podcast? I believe it's a valuable tool for the educated person of faith who yearns for a slightly more complex but thoughtful and edifying gospel-centered dialogue. Thank you, Bree Eva. I appreciate that review. You can rate and review the show in iTunes. We always read the reviews, and we appreciate every one of them. And now on with the show. It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. Americans in the early 19th century loved the writing of John Milton. Milton's embrace of liberal individualism, meritocracy, and his championing of the right to free speech made him an easy sell to anti-British Americans. His epic poem, Paradise Lost, was a bestseller. Something like 20 editions of Paradise Lost were produced in America during the first half of the 19th century, which is right when Mormonism came on the scene. Milton also held some controversial views on the nature of the Godhead, creation, and even polygamy. In this episode, Yale professor of English John Rogers joins us to talk about parallels and differences between Joseph Smith's revelations and John Milton's theology. Rogers recently visited BYU, where he delivered a Maxwell Institute guest lecture called Latter-day Milton, Early Mormonism and the Political Theologies of Paradise Lost. You can check that lecture out on the Institute's YouTube channel now. It's John Rogers in this episode talking about Milton and Mormonism. Questions and comments about the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. John Rogers joins us today on the Maxwell Institute podcast. We're talking about John Milton, the poet, and Mormonism. Welcome, John. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for um, having me, Blair. Um, we're having you here for a lecture uh, that you're doing here at Brigham Young University that's co-sponsored also by BYU's Medieval and Renaissance Studies, so I want to give a shout out to them as well. And people will be able to check that lecture out. It should already be up on our website at mi.byu.edu. So let's talk about the lecture a little bit, give people kind of an overview here. You're talking about early Mormons, so Joseph Smith mm -hmm. and some of his uh, earliest apostles there, That's right. and some ways that their thoughts and ideas resonated and perhaps even were inspired by or influenced by John Milton, the poet. Uh, yes, no, I, I, I understand that this is a complicated topic for a lot of people. There's an understandable reason why a lot of Mormon ideas and uh, Mormon imaginings uh, need to be thought of as, as as direct revelations. And I don't have a problem uh, with that since I myself sometimes find myself believing that John Milton was inspired by God to write Paradise Lost, as Milton tells us so often over the course of the poem. It is remarkable, and I have found myself just shocked by just bracketing early Mormon culture uh, for a moment by how many Americans in the early 19th century were reading and thinking about Milton. He's often referred to as our American poet because he's seen as so much more American, a liberal individualism and a kind of pro progressive meritocracy that so much of Milton's poetry affirms. And he seems so not British, at least to the anti-British early 19th century Americans in a, in a completely fascinating way. There's something like 20 editions of Paradise Lost, 20 different editions of Paradise Lost that are produced in America itself in the first half of the of the 19th century. It's uh, it's explosive. Yeah, and for some of these people in America, obviously there were some educated people, but there are also a lot of just sort of regular people, farm people, people like Joseph Smith or some of the people that joined the LDS church. So how would something as presumably highbrow as John Milton's poetry reach those people? It's a great question. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Paradise Lost has to be one of the most difficult elaborate, long poetic texts to read. It's, uh, 
It demands so much of the reader in terms of just literary sophistication. Its allusions to the entirety of the classical tradition um, are breathtaking, and its insistence on a kind of intimate fil familiarity with the with the Christian tradition is also can can feel quite daunting at times. However, since as early as the middle of the 18th century, it was understood, certainly in England, that Paradise Lost had within it so much important spiritual wisdom, so much spiritual truth that for some reason or another didn't make it into the Bible. Um, we learned, for example, in Paradise Lost about a war in heaven that's only mentioned in maybe a half of a verse in the book of Job in the, uh, in, in the Old Testament. Uh, Milton gives us a kind of prequel to so much of the Old Testament story that dominates our imagination because that's what we uh, what we have access to before we read Milton's remarkable poem. And so because it was seen to be so important for Christians, especially Protestants, to read Paradise Lost, numerous efforts were made in the 18th century to make this thing accessible. So there are versions of Paradise Lost that keep Milton's language, keep all of his words, but clean up the syntax so that things flow like modern English and not in the weird inverted and twisted way that they do so often on the on the actual page. Milton's word order is significantly shifted in uh, some of these early editions of simplified and abridged Paradise Lost. There's also, um, there are 18th century editions, uh, printed editions of Paradise Lost, 18th century editions of, of Paradise Lost in which Milton's words, his actual diction, is kept entirely intact, but the poetry is done away with. The thing is just turned into prose. And again, the syntax or the word order is also cleaned up to make it that much more accessible. One of my favorite late 18th century editions of Paradise Lost ignores all of the references, and they're everywhere, to the, uh, to the pagan tradition, to the classical world um, altogether, and only gives us footnotes to the, uh, to the Christian stuff, for, uh, the allusions to the Old Testament and the New Testament. I think one of the additions that must have meant the most to the early 19th century American, Mormons especially, was the specifically Methodist version, 18th century Methodist version of Paradise Lost. It's severely abridged. All of the long, wandering, exquisitely uh, learned similes and elaborate metaphors are simply just removed. They're extricated from the poem because they uh, detract from the story. And uh, anything that seems to run afoul of a good Arminian Methodist uh, teaching, it has just been done away with. So there's doctrinal editing as well. Serious yeah. doctrinal editing. And John Wesley, one of the Wesley brothers who founds and invents Methodism, takes it upon himself to clean up Paradise Lost and make it a poem safe for Methodists. Um, and weirdly and interestingly, this is just a an instance of how obsessive so many people were about Paradise Lost. The Wesley brothers, the founders of Methodism, grow up in a home that is entirely dominated by and saturated with John Milton. Um, their father did nothing but speak of John Milton, recite Milton's Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained from, from memory. And in fact, he writes his own version of Paradise Regained that for completely inexplicable reasons has just sutured into it hundreds of lines of Milton's Paradise Regained. <laughs> None of it makes any sense, but the, the passion for Milton is intense. Um, it's, it's often thought that Joseph Smith had a Methodist uh, background. The two of the early apostles that I'm particularly interested in, uh, Orson Pratt and his brother Parley P. Pratt, um, were also raised Methodists. The Methodist hymns, actually, in many cases to this day, are saturated with the language of Paradise Lost. So for, for, a, for a group of a certain kind of uh, lowbrow 19th century American Protestant, um, there is already an invitation to take seriously this poem. Any kind of direct evidence that you have discovered so far of, of Joseph Smith quoting from Milton or knowing about Milton or other early Mormons being familiar with Milton? I think that's an important question because, as we know, uh, Joseph Smith was not overwhelmingly uh, literate or certainly not what we would think of as a as a highly educated uh, reader. Obviously, he was a he was a brilliant man and a visionary thinker. Nonetheless, in one of the explanations of the reasons for the baptism of the dead that uh, Joseph Smith himself writes 
um, for the Mormon journal Times and Seasons, Joseph Smith quotes. He doesn't acknowledge quoting, but it's so clearly a quotation. From the opening of Paradise Lost, it may well be one of the most famous of all of the lines of, of Milton's Paradise Lost, and that's Milton's claim that he will assert eternal providence over the course of the poem and justify the ways of God to men. And Joseph Smith wonderfully explains the Mormon practice of the baptism of the dead as a practice that justifies the ways of God to men. Interestingly, I, I have gotten some uh, pushback from fellow Miltonists when I floated this idea, um, but I think it's actually right. If it had occurred to Milton to imagine the possibility of baptizing the dead and extending free will into the other world so that the choices that you make here aren't the final choices that you get to make, um, I think he would, have, uh, he would have embraced that immediately. The notion that free will is something that doesn't just conclude at, the, uh, at, at one's final demise in this world is, uh, is something that I think he would find really interesting. Mm. And obviously the vision that he stretches out in the poem of, of a pre-mortal existence where angels and God, uh, a war in heaven are happening. And it doesn't equally map with LDS theology, but there are a lot of resonances there. And, and, and as you suggest in your lecture, uh, the ubiquity of Milton, uh, it would have almost been impossible for Mormons not to have uh, been familiar with John Milton, at least with the poem. And I, I, I think that's right. Um, but not just the poem. Milton also writes a theological treatise. Um, he does this probably in the years just before he begins Paradise Lost. However, it happens to be a, a theological treatise that's quite heretical. Um, not just heretical on 17th century standards, but heretical by almost any Christian standard. So he tried to spread it as far and wide as possible? Is <laughs> as, that what as you're saying? As far and wide no. as possible. <laughs> yeah. No, it disappeared, right, for, for a time. Wasn't it rediscovered? Uh... Uh, Milton uh, was a prudent man. And he thought, and this is completely understandable, he thought it would be wise not to have this thing published in his lifetime. Mm. It is a capital crime, not only in England, but in every country in Europe up until the end of the 17th century. It's a capital crime for which one is burned at the stake if one is found guilty of publicly denying the existence of the Trinity. And Milton devotes the longest and most crazily elaborate chapter of his theological treatise to his denial of the existence of the of the Holy Trinity. Um, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are entirely separate, fully individuated beings. The Father is in fact the Father of the Son. He is a he is the Son's creator. Um, there's a there's that kind of anti-Trinitarianism that that Mormons certainly take up. The poem depicts it that way, but and he and there wasn't a lot of blowback there. Was that because it could be interpreted you know, symbolically, or I think that's really interesting. He you has know, a God talking about his son Jesus in a premortal war. Correct. You're absolutely right, Milton. It seems to us now that we know that Milton was um, a card-carrying anti-Trinitarian, <laughs> and that he was willing intellectually to take on the huge and uh, dominating church teaching of the existence of the Trinity. <laughs> That's right. And he did it, you know, uh, well, not at extraordinary cost. Um, happily, he wasn't uh, found out or, or caught. But yeah, in light of that, we can read lots of sections of Paradise Lost and see the ways in which Milton was an Arian, a believer in the, the absolute difference between the Father and the Son. It's amazing in that light how few people in the in the 17th century, in the 18th century, and even in the early years of the 19th century, ever got anything close to that idea. Hmm. The, the notion that Milton, because he's a great poet, has also to be a greatly um, orthodox poet is, is absolute. If, he is a, if he's a divinely inspired poet, he has to believe all the right things. Um, one of the very few early readers of Paradise Lost who read immediately and understood that Milton was really dancing on a theological edge with his heretical understanding that the son is merely a creature um, rather than God himself, was Daniel Defoe, the author of Robinson Crusoe. Mm -hmm. He uh, calls out in print Milton as an Arian, uh, which means a heretical believer in the in the son's status as a creature rather than as a part of the Godhead. Um, other than, uh, you know, a couple of other people in addition to Daniel Defoe, otherwise it just struck early readers as 
a regular Orthodox yeah. poem. Well, you've got the New Testament, Jesus praying to God the Father, and that didn't disrupt uh, ideas of the Trinity. So in a similar way, I suppose you could read Milton's poem in the same in the same light. So this treatise on Christian doctrine, it's published in 1825 in London, 1826 it hits America, so this is a couple of years before the LDS Church is established. That's right. And uh, you found that some early Mormons, including Orson Pratt, drew directly from the treatise uh, on Christian doctrine, particularly with in Orson Pratt's public defense of Mormon polygamy. So uh, yes, in the uh, in the 17th century, it would have been a capital offense for Milton publicly deny the existence of the Trinity. Um, he also, in his theological treatise, spends a number of pages, and they're extraordinary. Um, he dedicates them to the explanation of why, in his opinion, the practice of polygamy continues to be allowable uh, by God, that it's simply a lot of wrong-headed, uh, mistaken readings of the Bible that have suggested to Christians that now that we're no longer in the patriarchal age, uh, poly polygamy is um, illegal. Um, it has been suggested before, and I think there's um, there's a lot of reason to believe that Milton's theological treatise, once it was translated into English, published in, uh, in the United States, um, and widely publicized for all of its heresies, especially the anti-Trinitarianism and its big stamp of approval on the practice of polygamy, uh, that just became almost universally understood. Church newsletters, magazines, uh, newspapers of all sorts circulated the information that, and it was scandalous at the time. We now know in 1826 that John Milton, the great poet of the great English epic Paradise Lost, believed in God's permission of polygamy. A lot of people misunderstood that to think that Milton himself what had been a polygamist, which we don't have any uh, which we don't have any evidence of directly. but that uh, that was scandalous. And I think it would have been really difficult for an early generation of seriously invested religious thinkers um, not to have that information. Uh, brought to their attention. Do you think that really lessened Milton in a lot of eyes of people? Because when Orson Pratt then draws on Milton, mm -hmm. is he drawing on him because he likes the, the force of Milton's arguments? Or is he drawing on him also because Milton was still viewed as a really credible or important person? And so there's also that sort of, hey, we're, you know, don't criticize what we're doing. John Milton says it's okay, too. Like, how much of that do you think was involved in Pratt's defense? No, I, th I, I think that's, um, I think that's really important. It's, um, I think the documents show uh, that this new revelation in 1826 that was so uh, well publicized that Milton believed in polygamy, it really, that fact itself really divided all readers of, of Renaissance English poetry, certainly all readers of Paradise Lost. Mm. The polite Protestants of the Methodists, the uh, Baptists, the Presbyterians, certainly the Episcopalians, Suddenly, it happened something like overnight, started to feel that Milton's Paradise Lost might not be the safe, orthodox, spiritually um, edifying poem that it had always been taken to be. Um, that was, without question, the majority view. Uh, there's evidence that shows that Milton is being taught less in schools. Paradise Lost, the great speeches in hell, for example, are being used less and less often as models for students' own oratorical um, <laughs> efforts. It's extraordinary. Satan's how, the best character for people who haven't <laughs> read it. In Paradise uh, Lost, it has the, the, you know. Everybody so, should read Paradise Lost yeah. for the character of Satan yeah. alone. So they're He's using him less now. You're saying like after Milton's reputation is getting shot here, they're. Uh, Milton just is no longer seen as our American poet. He's no longer the great um, standard bearer for a good conservative American Protestantism, Milton was a polygamist. And so the, the, the jury is, uh, is really divided, and it's a small minority of readers who find themselves with this new information that Milton denied the existence of the Trinity and that Milton was a polygamist, um, or at least believed in uh, the possibility of polygamy, who found themselves gravitating to Milton, maybe even for the first time. Mm on the back of this new information. I think it's reasonable to, to assume that the anti-Trinitarian early Mormons um, found this idea that Milton approved of polygamy uh, compelling.
That's John Rogers. He's a professor of English at Yale University. He's the author of Matter of Revolution, Science, Poetry, and Politics in the Age of Milton. And he's also currently working on a book tentatively titled Latter-day Milton, Paradise Lost and the Creation of America's God. So let's talk more about Milton and Mormons in particular. Joseph Smith, in a discourse that's become famous and, and well-known amongst Mormons called the King Follett Discourse, talked about uh, God, talked about uh, what matter is, what intelligence is, and all of these theological ideas that you say resonate with some of the things that can be found in Milton as well. So talk about some of the parallels that, that you see there. One of the beautiful and and most startling things about that late sermon of Joseph Smith's um, just a few months before he died, the, the King Follett sermon, um, is his description of the material world, which he refuses uh, fully to divorce from the spiritual world. All matter is spiritual and all spirit is material in Joseph Smith's really bold metaphysics voiced at this funeral sermon. It's, uh, it's quite extraordinary. He also uh, allows us to understand that the Godhead is much more complicated um, than polite American Protestantism would like us to believe. There are even multiple divinities in, in Joseph Smith's heaven, and there's room for promotion and elevation. Virtue, obedience can allow for a deity to be exalted to an even higher state of godhood. Uh, this is one of the most shocking inventions, literary inventions, that we find in Paradise Lost. So much of Paradise Lost has some conceptual origin in some work of classical literature, in some work of any aspect of medieval or Renaissance Christian doctrine. And scripture, obviously, and as well. Obviously, yeah. uh, Milton has committed so much of scripture to memory and is, is tries to be as faithful to it as, as he possibly can. And we find certain aspects of the plot in Paradise Lost absolutely unprecedented. And maybe the most central is what is for Milton the first event to happen in the chronology of the story. So what happened in in heaven before the fall of Adam and Eve? Well, there was a war in heaven, we learn, and Satan is cast into hell. Milton also asks this question, what happens in heaven before the war in heaven, and why does a war erupt in the first place? And he gives us this explanation. For no reason at all, or at least no apparent reason, that is made clear to the assembly of angels, the Father, um, God the Father, announces that one of these beings in heaven is now called the Son of God, the only Son of God, complicated for the angels who had also thought of themselves as sons of God, that that Son of God will now be seen to serve at his right hand and will eventually, uh, we learn at another juncture in the poem, will eventually become God himself, will assume the Godhead and assume all of the power and all of the authority of the Father. This notion of an elevation or an exaltation from one state of divinity to another. Um, there are very few representations of such an idea anywhere in the Christian tradition. Um, Milton gives us one, and Joseph Smith gives us maybe even a bolder one. Um, I don't know. I think that's uh, one reason to imagine that early Mormonism had some kind of tie, at least to the plot of Paradise Lost. But back to Joseph Smith's sense of matter being spiritual and spirit being material, this is a, this is a, a bit of metaphysics that's really beautifully, gorgeously represented in Paradise Lost, as well as in the theological treatise. Milton really bets the farm on this little bit of metaphysics that there is no, as all of his contemporaries believed. In the 17th century, what one thought was that spirit and matter were absolutely distinct entities, that there's a perfect gulf between them. Milton weds them or brings them together. And Joseph Smith uh, begins to articulate um, his understanding of the relationship of matter and spirit in, a, in, in such a way that suggests, at least to me, that he has read Paradise Lost, um, or at least part of Paradise Lost has been drawn to his attention, and maybe even the, the, the very well-publicized theological treatise um, on Christian doctrine. Yeah, why don't you read that little portion there from Paradise Lost, um, where Milton talks about the one substance. It's one of my favorite passages in the poem. Uh, the angel Raphael has come down to Eden to warn Adam and Eve uh, that there is an enemy out there and they need to be on their guard. 
He also gives Adam and Eve a lot of information about the makeup of the cosmos. And it, he gives them a little metaphysical lesson. It's not nearly as dry and as um, intellectualized as one might think. So I'm going to read it. It's, uh, these are beautiful lines. O oh, Adam, one Almighty is, from whom all things proceed and up to him return, if not depraved from good. Created all, such to perfection, one first matter all. So in that collection of four words, one first matter all, Milton, through the mouthpiece of the angel Raphael, is making an extraordinary claim that everything that we know in this universe, that includes our souls, our bodies, the entire, the entirety of the cosmos, came from one original entity, and it was entirely material. And we also learn, at least in the theological treatise, that that is nothing other than the body of God itself. We all have that uh, first origin. So one first matter, all endued with various forms, various degrees of substance, and in things that live of life. And these are the lines that Joseph Smith echoes in a couple of places, as does Orson Pratt and his brother Parley Pratt. Joseph Smith explains in that beautiful King Follett sermon that spirit is nothing other than matter, and it is matter that has been refined and purified. He's using the language of Raphael from Milton's Paradise Lost. Orson Pratt will do exactly the same thing as will Parley Pratt. They will take time to explain to their readers exactly what the soul is and what the spirit is. It's a form of matter, and it's matter that's refined and pure. Um, I think it's inescapable, this idea that I don't see any other possible origin or inspiration for such a beautifully delineated way of understanding the relation of matter spirit, that matter and spirit, than to uh, think of Joseph Smith as a reader, as an auditor, as uh, someone who has some relation uh, to the beautiful poetry of Paradise Lost. And one actually doesn't need in the early 19th century, to have read Paradise Lost, to have this detailed a sense of its uh, exquisite spiritual metaphysics. Um, these lines that I've just read of Raphael's in Book 5 of Paradise Lost are quoted everywhere in the early 19th century. Uh, the, the translator of the theological treatise that's just been discovered devotes an enormous amount of time in his footnotes, drawing the reader's attention to this passage. And it's not until the early 19th century that readers focus on Milton's metaphysics. This becomes a new thing that we can attach to, to Milton. And uh, I don't know, you don't even need to read one of the abridged versions of Paradise Lost or one of the syntactically simplified versions of Paradise Lost. Um, the Methodist Church also produced in addition to its abridged Paradise Lost, which, by the way, is available in paperback in a volume titled Milton for the Methodists. Um, <laughs> run to your bookstores now. Did you edit that or something? Uh, or are you just giving it a free no, it, this buzz is a, marketing? This, this is a free plug um, uh, <laughs> from me. There is a wildly popular book sponsored by the Methodist Church called Paradise Lost for Children. Hmm. Uh, it is uh, written by an extraordinary woman who explains to mothers how they can read Paradise Lost to their children. So it's not exactly a dumbed-down version of Paradise Lost. It's something like a model mm. or a handbook for how you would present this uh, incredibly demanding and difficult poem to your very small children. She tells you when to just summarize the plot and when you can actually drill down and read some lines itself. And so many of the passages that the early Mormons are really interested in are taken really seriously uh, by this particular Methodist volume, hmm. Paradise Lost for Children. This thing is everywhere. One thing I'll say, interject as well, you mentioned this idea of influence and different members of the LDS church will try to accommodate that in different ways. Obviously, you'll have some people that would say, if if it's something Joseph Smith could have picked up from his environment, it couldn't have been inspired. Other Mormons would say, he didn't pick it up from his environment. Everything was revealed directly by God. If it 
resonates with something else, so be it. And there are other Mormons who would say that part of Joseph's revelatory role would be in sort of combining these elements that he kind of like – Joseph Smith depicted a god who organized matter. <laughs> and, and Joseph Smith as a prophet would then also be one who organized matter. He, he didn't create it ex nihilo. He created it using – using things that are already out there. So so Mormons would accommodate this idea of of borrowing or being influenced by Milton in different ways and and critics of Mormonism or people who are indifferent to Mormonism. There there are a lot of different things to do with that in terms of influence, but I wanted to ask before we moved on as well, why was that idea so potentially dangerous for Christians? The idea that matter uh, that there was this one first matter all that then everyone came from that wasn't just something everyone was happy to hear. That that also bothered some, I think, a lot of Christians. It disrupts a lot of familiar Orthodox thinking that um, has to put a big positive sign, a big thumbs up on anything that's spiritual, immaterial, and therefore divine and good. And um, it becomes, in that light, really easy. And we're all familiar with these ways of thinking, of imagining matter, the bodily world, as coarse, as vulgar, as something lesser. It's and fallen. It's gross matter. It's it's it's, yeah. it's, it's gro- sinful, even like right. I mean, depraved. Uh, it's 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 depraved from good. It is uh, everything that is material for a lot of people in the Renaissance, when Milton was living, and certainly a lot of people in the 19th century, and actually a lot of people now are happy to consign the material world, the bodily world, to some lesser world uh, that we can comfortably associate with evil rather than with God. And so think of what think of what happens when you allow yourself to imagine um, that matter is actually a condensed form of spirit and that spirit is always material. There's a kind of implicit divine blessing on everything that's bodily, the sexual, the drives, all of those things that we're often in a lot of traditions embarrassed about, although not in Mormonism. Um, suddenly have been given this exaltation or this elevation to an entirely new level. It's uh, it's really quite extraordinary. Milton was very sex positive. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a kind of coarse uh, 21st century way of thinking about some of the energy of Paradise Lost. But Milton goes out of his way in Paradise Lost to make sure that we understand that and, and this is not uh, taken up in Mormonism. He makes sure that we understand that Adam and Eve had a healthy sex life before the fall. The fall does not bring with it carnal knowledge. It brings with it, you know, a lots of uh, lots of things, um, but it does not bring with it uh, the sex drive or the, uh, the the interest and the capacity to have sexual intercourse. Um, Milton places his divine blessing on that, and that's you know that's that's that has a lot to do with why. Metaphysically, he needs to divinize or spiritualize the bodily, the corporeal, and the material. One of the things about Joseph Smith's King Follett discourse is he presented it pretty shortly before he died. And so he didn't have the opportunity to elaborate on it, to sit down and do Q&A or, you know, publish more things about this. However, his, uh, his apostles and people that followed him in church leadership after his death did expand on this. And what you do in your lecture is to talk about some of the ways that different people within the Mormon tradition interpreted Joseph Smith. So let's talk a little bit about where they went and how they compare to what Milton was doing, because there's some really interesting differences in how Milton would depict this one matter that everyone came from versus how some of these Mormon interpreters, particularly the Pratt brothers, did with it. That's right. Yeah, and you're right. It's not until the last couple of years of his life that Joseph puts himself under the pressure to develop something that looks like a Christian theology. And, uh, and, and it's, it's wild, it's beautiful, and it is uh, like nothing else ever articulated. A lot of it seemed gnomic or utterly mysterious mm. in, its, uh, in its seeming wisdom. And it's this particular idea that Joseph Smith articulates in the King Follett sermon that God finds himself. This is how this is the origin of things, or at least one version of the origin of things. God finds himself amidst the spirits. Um, he does not create the spirit of man. He does not create, this is another way of Joseph Smith's articulations, he does not create man's intelligence. Those pre-exist. They, are they as old as God? Are they older than God? Uh, we don't know. 
But in, that in the put, Doctrine and Covenants, he would say, like, you were in the beginning. There's a revelation that says that intelligence, that was in the beginning with God. Same with Jesus. So they're, they're all put on this same plane. That the intelligence or the spirit of man and yeah. God himself yep. um, coexist. Yes. Now, the question is that may, remains in Mormonism to this day is, was that intelligence like a person? Some people talk about, and this is a side, this is a side road that people people already know about but basically the idea of spirit birth versus the idea of intelligences that have lived forever so these are two different sort of strains in mormon thought orson pratt is obviously very moved by this powerful idea of joseph smith's and it's uh it's really extraordinary what orson pratt comes up with metaphysically in order to justify this magnificent notion that the spirit of man the intelligence of man is as old as god himself and this is how Orson explains it. It's every atomic microparticle of the universe is nothing other than a potential intelligence or spirit of man. Uh, so Orson Pratt teaches us in uh, this remarkable, it's called Great First Cause, remarkable metaphysical treatise that in the beginning, in the true beginning, a beginning even before the beginning than, Joseph, than the one Joseph Smith uh, articulates in the, in the sermon, in the beginning, there are innumerable, an infinity of microatomic particles um, that are material and spiritual. And intelligent. Like they are intelligent. They have agency. They are wise and they are obedient. To whom are they obedient is an obvious question. Um, Orson Pratt imagines a time when there was no God. There was nothing but the, the spiritual microparticles. And he puts himself in this position. He explains to us where God came from. God, of course, in all other Christian traditions, comes first, and he is the creator, the, the source of everything. For Orson Pratt, uh, God is secondary. You have the spiritual microparticles of this remarkable universal chaos that somehow or other, he doesn't exactly explain how, begin because they are wise, they are sentient, they are conscious, um, and they have a capacity for being obedient, although there are no laws yet. Um, They're going to decide on those laws, right? They will decide on those laws. Um, these microparticles uh, congregate. Um, they begin consensually in a very American and democratic sort of way. They begin consensually to form smaller unions that become larger unions. Um, we have no idea how many eons this takes, but for Orson Pratt, an innumerable uh, quantity of these microparticles aggregate and form the being that we now know as uh, know of as God the Father. Another assembly of microparticles um, congregates over how many eons we don't know and forms the Son. And then the Holy Spirit is yet another large congregational mass of atomic particles. Uh, it's the atomic and they, become, and they become humans. These become the spirits that God found himself amongst. And by the way, really quick, this differs from Milton because Milton had angels and God, but Adam and Eve were created in the garden, right? They didn't precede the Garden of Eden. Is that right? That's right. Milton does not uh, have anything like a doctrine of preexistence. Yeah, I just wanted more um, Adam to and keep Eve, that in mind. Yes, Adam and Eve uh, in Milton's poem are created after the creation of the earth and truly as it says in the book of genesis yep. on the sixth on the sixth day of creation yeah, sorry to interject but to catch you back up basically orson pratt kicks the story back f way further than joseph smith did and then brings it to this point of of that makes god an effect of these particles and these other things rather than god as the ground of all being and it's um it's hard for me to imagine a more daring a more radical or a bolder vision of of the of divinity. Well, there is another bold one, though. This is the this is the surprising. If you haven't heard the lecture yet, maybe go listen first. But spoiler alert: there's something that Milton wrote that resonates with Orson Pratt in a surprising way. I happen to think that Orson Pratt, in this wild and really daring speculation of the creation of God, is thinking of uh, an extraordinary moment from from Paradise Lost, and it happens in Book Five of the of the twelve books of Paradise Lost. Um, Satan has an argument with a loyalist angel uh, just preceding the war in heaven in which 
Satan insists that he owes no allegiance to God, um, has no reason to obey the Father because the Father was not his creator. The Father cannot be said to have formed or made Satan or, in fact, any of the angels. It's a bold conceptual move on Satan's part, absolutely unprecedented. He says, prove it if you think otherwise. Do you remember it? And yeah, Rememberst thou thy making? Yeah. Yeah. He asks uh, yeah. his adversary, priggish, loyalist angel yes. friend. And, of course, the answer is no, because no one remembers one's creation. And because we can't remember it, we must – this is Satan's argument – we must have created ourselves. Um, we know no time when we were not as now, no none before us, self-begot, self-made of our own quickening power. It's uh, – how does that work exactly? A lot of readers have thought. How can we create ourselves when the we that's creating ourselves is also the thing that's being created? Orson Pratt understood that Satan, in this passage that he obviously loved, has fallen into a logical trap. And so Orson posits something that makes more logical sense. You have all of these innumerable individual um, entities uh, that are sentient and conscious, and they congregate together to form uh, angels. They actually congregate together to form pre-existent human beings. And as I just suggested, they have also, at the very beginning of time, created God himself. So Orson Pratt makes Satan's argument, but a little bit differently. That's kind of the surprise here. I think Orson Pratt learns a lot from Milton Satan, untwists some of Satan's bad, bad logic, and turns it into something that actually, um, in a sort of semi-science fiction way, makes sense. But that wasn't uh, the only Mormon response. In fact, it, ironically enough, it would be uh, – or not ironically, but interestingly enough, it would be Orson Pratt's own brother, Parley, that would uh, object to this and offer something different. And it's so fascinating what you do in the lecture is you talk about what Orson Pratt did with that. And, and uh, people uh, that haven't heard the lecture yet, I encourage you to go do that because there um, Dr. Rogers also talks about alternate visions that Parley P. Pratt offers uh, – to counter Orson Pratt's view on this. And he also talks about some of the institutional reasons uh, why these uh, different theories were being offered. As, uh, Orson's was much more de democratic and open, which aligned with some of the ways he believed church government should, uh, should go. And Parley's was much more uh, centered on God as a figurehead, as a presider, and uh, and matched what Brigham Young's vision for church leadership was. So uh, check out the lecture and you'll hear more about that. We're talking today with John Rogers. He's a Milton specialist. He's a professor of English at Yale University and the author of Matter of Revolution, Science, Poetry, and Politics in the Age of Milton. He's working on a number of projects right now that include a book that's tentatively titled Latter-day Milton, Paradise Lost, and the Creation of America's God. Before we go, I wanted to ask just a few broader questions about uh, about theology and literature. What are your thoughts about engaging theologically with literature, the value of a figure like John Milton for someone's religious beliefs? I think for uh, an amazing intellect and writer like John Milton, there's not a, a really obvious and bright line between the intellectual and imaginative activity that goes into uh, theological thinking and the imaginative intellectual activity that goes into producing a remarkable work of literature. Both require some kind of attentiveness to scripture from, from Milton's perspective, and both activities require a kind of boldness of mind and a willingness to think outside of the box. Uh, Milton, it seems clear, was preparing himself to write Paradise Lost and was thinking about how he was going to um, allow this story of the fall of Adam and Eve and the fall that preceded that, um, the fall of the angels. He was imagining how that would uh, play out in his work of literature that he, was, uh, he knew he would begin writing soon as he was producing the theological treatise. The theological treatise is, of course, written in Latin rather, rather than English. It um, can seem very forbidding at times. It's its commitment to certain scholastic forms of argument can can be very off-putting uh, and require a demanding set of intellectual an antennae to, to understand what he's actually um, what he's actually doing. But Milton is creatively reading scripture in in his theology, and obviously he's creatively thinking about everything when he's writing a, a work of literature. But they're both 
different forms of truth. I don't think one is fiction and one is truth, um, one is spiritual and one is material. For Milton, I think it seems reasonable to assume uh, these are just two different activities that a right-thinking Christian can reasonably engage in. You mentioned earlier about your own thoughts about Milton and possibly even inspiration. Do you mind saying something a little bit about your own uh, your own background in terms of how studying Milton has influenced you on a religious side of things? Because you, you approach it as a scholar, but uh, are you also a religious person? I was raised a Baptist in, a, in an American Baptist church in a little town in Kansas. Um, I will never forget my first reading of Paradise Lost. It was my freshman year in college. And it was my come to Jesus moment. It really uh, was absolutely, completely overwhelming to me. I couldn't believe that a human being actually was able to envision something so grand and in, in many cases uh, so shocking as well as beautiful. I don't know if I've ever seriously thought, took seriously Milton's uh, insistence in Paradise Lost, that he was, in fact, inspired by God to write this thing. Um, it can't seem to a lot of readers that Milton must have been inspired by God to write Paradise Lost because he wrote it blind. Um, he only dictated it to uh, secretaries, and he only experienced it when it was read back to him. He, uh, he was completely uh, incapable of reading at that point. So I, uh, I, have had, I have had the opportunity to teach Milton to college students um, for some 25 years now. And I have had students who are offended by it. I have students uh, who uh, find everything that they read in Paradise Lost as surely created by the devil because it runs so completely counter what they have been taught to believe. I've also had students who are absolutely insistently believing that Milton was in fact inspired by God to write, to, to write this remarkable thing. Uh, where do I fall? I don't. Um, I am not a believer in any ordinary sense. I think <laughs> I. Um, I find myself moved, and I have to say, I don't say this often. I find myself spiritually elevated <laughs> when I read the 17th century poetry and prose that I love, in which uh, Milton and a lot of his contemporaries are really struggling to make sense of a world that just doesn't seem to make sense. So they're, they're trying to do this um, through uh, some kind of really attentive and smart reading of the Bible. Uh, that, that moves me to no end. I also find really moving the idea that Joseph Smith, some of the early apostles, might have found some kind of inspiration in some sort of encounter uh, with Milton's theological treatise and with Milton's with Milton's poem, uh, and, and, and has been argued and noted at least since the 19th century. Joseph Smith and, and many others were responding to a lot of the materials they had around them. Uh, Joseph Smith was known to have been a Mason, and he seems to have borrowed a lot of, um, a, a lot of the ritual, ritual liturgical literary aspects of Masonry in some of his own uh, liturgical imaginings. I think he may well have done something uh, quite similar with, with Paradise Lost. I take really seriously the importance of Joseph Smith's insistence that God creates the universe out of pre-existing materials, that God is not in a position to create matter itself. It's already there. In so many ways, we see Joseph Smith responding to the world around him, to the poetry that he's reading, to the ideas that he's getting from all sorts of um, avenues. Um, he's piecing them together, as we all do, as we all have no choice but to do. And uh, was he inspired by God to do it? Um, I'm, uh, I, I am happy to honor anyone uh, who is invested in that belief. I, mean, I think it's interesting to think of Milton as well in, in drawing on classic literature and scripture and, and doing a similar act as well of, of you know, it was an, a remarkable original creation that he made, but it also wasn't ex nihilo either. There's... Milton uh, knows when we read Paradise Lost, we're going to recognize a thousand different um, allusions to the great classical epics, uh, Homer's Iliad, Homer's Odyssey, and Virgil's Aeneid. He understands that we will understand how 
powerfully those great works of literature influenced him. Nonetheless, he will insist in the same work of literature that he was inspired by a heavenly muse, the Holy Spirit itself, to write the beautiful poetry of Paradise Lost. He didn't see inspiration coming by means of reading and inspiration coming from God uh, itself or himself as in any way contradictory. I don't see why we can't or believing Mormons can't attribute that same kind of generous understanding of inspiration and influence when thinking of Joseph Smith. Yeah, I, knew, I know many members of the LDS Church that do. That's John Rogers. He's a professor of English at Yale University. Today we talked to him about Mormonism and John Milton, the, the great poet. Obviously, both of us would commend to all the listeners if they haven't had the opportunity to read Paradise Lost. Uh, it does take a lot of effort, but I, I think it's well worth the effort. And I think it's great that you've spent so much time on the poem. I want to give a little shout out to a very special experience for those uh, listeners out there who don't want to struggle reading Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost comes in an unabridged, in a couple of different unabridged audiobooks. The poem is remarkable as an experience to listen to. We're talking about a blind poet who couldn't read the thing, um, who only heard himself pronounce it and have it read, having it read back to him. It's something that has to be experienced orally. And I think an audiobook is as easily as uh, powerful and as moving an experience as actually looking at the words on the page and trying to make sense of them. Do you have a preferred version that you liked, a particular narrator, or are they all pretty good? I can't remember the names of either narrator, but um, the uh, both of the versions that are available on audible.com are excellent. Very good. All right, John, thanks for coming in today. I really appreciate you spending time with us. Thank you very much. This has been a real pleasure. 